There we go. Nehemiah chapter 4, we're continuing on with this study of discouragement. And um, last week, we saw first the sources of discouragement. Um, we saw that Nehemiah was trying to do a great work. He's trying to do something good by rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, by allowing Jerusalem to be a place that could be defended, but also that could prosper. And of course, the outside influences that were there didn't like that. There were ones that said, no, we're going to do everything that we can to put you down, to discourage you, that you might not accomplish the task that you have. You know what? We in our own lives will deal with discouragement. Those sources will come our way. But as we go through the rest of this passage, what we want to do is look at the responses to discouragement. The responses to discouragement. It's interesting as we look at this. Nehemiah is facing the greatest test of his leadership. He's got all of these people, and the big question is, what exactly do I do? He is basically governor of this area, and if there's a falter there, if there's something there's a mess up, then his people might actually lose their lives. So I want to look at his responses, his responses to the discouragement that we're all going around. Now I think the most important one, one I could actually camp out on for a real long time is, the very first thing that he did, he prayed. Nehemiah prayed. Verses 4 and 5 in the first part of verse 9, he says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. And we pray to our God. Verse 9 is what it says. They pray to their God. Disaster looms if nothing is done. But Nehemiah, his response begins on his knees. His response is, I want to pray. And you know, it's interesting, it calls on God for vengeance. This is not one of those, oh Lord, bless us prayers. This is, Lord, those are our enemies, take them to the woodshed. Go beat them up. You know, don't hide their sin. Go and let them be ravaged. It was the idea of saying, Lord, these people are absolutely against you. These people are your enemies trying to prevent you from doing your will. Therefore, we want you to remove them from us. He saw these people as openly opposing the works of God. Therefore, this prayer, this prayer was made. And I got to thinking about this. One of the things that Christians battle with, and it doesn't matter the era, the time, the, the, um, it doesn't matter the geography, it doesn't matter any of those things. Forgetfulness is one of the biggest struggles in the Christian life. When we are close to God, when we are right there in his presence, things are great. Things are good. We have bad things happen. We can have monkey wrenches get thrown our way. And we're okay because we're like, oh, God is there. But when we begin to forget God, that's when everything falls apart. And the easiest way we can forget God is we can forget to pray. <clears throat> I want to notice two truths about this. First is this. The attacks of the devil, discouragement included, will try and push, push us away from prayer. The attacks of the devil, discouragement included, will try to push us away from prayer. You think about it. Discouragement beats us down. Have you ever been like so tired 
you know, I, I've got a routine to go to bed. Get my contacts out, I wash my contacts. I brush my teeth, um, uh, sometimes put the hand lotion on. You, you do have a, have a routine to get in bed. You ever been so tired, you're like, bare minimum, I just want to get in bed. I don't care what all my, my thing is. You know, put pajamas on, forget it. I'm wearing these clothes. I don't care if they're dirty or not. Like, I'm going to bed. It's because we're tired, right? Because we're like, I, I know, that, that uh, toothbrush weighs too much. My arm ain't going to do it. Discouragement is like that. It makes us weary. It makes us not want to do what we ought. And you think about it, if there's one thing the devil wants us not to do, it's to pray. It's to pray and say, Lord, I want to be close to you. The enemy wants to disconnect us from our source of power. He wants us to disconnect from that source. And... Um, you think about it, there's so many blessings that are found in prayer. What are some of the blessings that we find when we, when we get on our knees, when we have our quiet time, when we go to the Lord in prayer, what are some blessings that come our way? No blessings. No. Peace. Okay. Peace has been taken. It's off the board now. What else? You feel lighter when you Oh. Giving your burdens to the Lord. Oh yeah, you, you got, you know, you have all these things shouldered on you. I got to worry about this. Got to worry about that. Got to worry about this. <laughs> and I, I heard this from a preacher years and years ago. He says, "Pray, and whatever burden you got, give it to God. And if you bring your hands back and you still got that burden, keep praying. He ain't got any burdens left. Mm -hmm. and that's the idea. You're lighter when you." Here we have prayer. What else? I think it gives us perspective. Oh yeah. I like that saying: if if we worry, why pray? And if we pray, why worry? Mmm. I like that. That that ought to be on a t-shirt. <laughs> make that. Make some money off that. If you worry, why pray? And if you pray, why worry? That's that's good because it gives you it gives you perspective of who God is. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, I got the God of all the universe who has heaven and earth in his hands and he can do anything he wants to and I just gave him my problem. Yeah, it's giving good hands right there. He gives you perspective. Anything else? Sometimes you get an answer. Yeah. Not always, but sometimes. Not immediately. Well, sometimes they are like that. Or we find that in the Bible. We find it in our own life. But sometimes it also gives us the comfort of knowing, you know what, God knows about it and the answer's going to come. Might not be the answer we want, but we know what's going to come. Um, I, I think about it, it gives me direction. A lot of times I'm doing that. Me, I've ever, you know, gotten so burdened, you're like, I don't know what to do. But then you spend about 5, 10, 15 minutes in prayer, and you get up off, those, off your knees, and you're like, oh, wait a minute here. I know exactly what I need to do, where I need to go, who I need to call, what I need to say. You just know. That's the idea of prayer. It connects us with amazing power. It connects us right to where God is. I'm going to ask you a weird question. Why does a chihuahua bark? I think you see something. All right. Go ahead. It's in its nature. There it's in its nature. <laughs> I would, uh, I would um, put forth this answer. Because it's the only thing it can do. <laughs> Y'all know we had chihuahuas. We had sugar here for a little while. Sugar in her prime. Which that's weird to say about a chihuahua. Something that weighed six pounds at her heaviest. She could run real well. And I would take a tennis ball, and I could throw that tennis ball, and that dog ran after it. Boom. I mean, it was fast. And it would get to that tennis ball, 
and look at it and then run all the way back because it couldn't fit in its mouth. She could not pick up a tennis ball, run after it. The chihuahua barks because that's basically all it can do. You, you, you're not going to get mauled by a chihuahua. You don't get mauled or you don't get anything substantially done by a little six-pound dog. The devil, it, it barks to try to intimidate. It barks to say, hey, look, look at me, look at me. I'm, I'm bigger than what I am. The devil will send discouragement our way to say, hey, get away from prayer. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplications, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Notice, notice this too, another little quick truth. If our enemy knows the power of prayer, we should too. If the enemy knows the power of prayer, we should too. I'll give you a simple truth, a simple thing to remember. Prayer is forgotten first. Prayer is forgotten first. It's a thank you. It's a um, it's something we do. We forget. We're going through and we're doing Bible study. We're doing all these things. The first thing, if we trip up, the first thing we usually forget is prayer. So Nehemiah understood the importance of prayer. He recognized what he must do before anything else, he prayed. But notice also this. He had the response of prayer, but also this. Nehemiah persevered. He persevered. Verse 6. So we built the wall. And all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Verse 15, when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that the, God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. Notice it says the people had a mind to work. Yeah, their minds were assaulted. They were uh, bombarded with discouragement. They were dealing with the effects of exhaustion. Fear played tricks on their minds. They struggled with the enormity of the task, but they had a mind to work. They were like, you know what? I am not giving up. I'm not giving up. I am going to do this. So the question might be asked of us, what do you have a mind to do? Or what you have a mind to do you usually do. The question is, what do you have a mind to do? Because what you have a mind to do, you usually do. Um, to me, y'all have ever heard the name William Wilberforce? You've heard it. Um, you know what it's in conjunction to. He's known as being one of the ones who spearheaded the stopping of slavery in England. He was um, discouraged one night in early 1790 uh, after another defeat in his 10-year battle against the slave trade in England. Tired and flushed, frustrated, he opened his Bible and began to leaf through it. A small piece of paper fell out and fluttered to the floor. It was a letter written by John Wesley shortly before his death. Wilberforce read it again. Unless the divine power has raised you up, I see not how you can go through that your glorious enterprise in opposing that abominable practice of slavery, which is the scandal of religion of England and of a human nature. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them together stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing. Go on in the name of God 
and in the power of his might. The Wilberforce prevailed and the slave trade was essentially ended through his help. Friends, let us not forget what we make up our minds to do, we usually can do. It's the idea of saying we're going to have perseverance. Think about your, uh, your children, grandchildren, if they're playing a video game or if they're playing a sport or if they're doing something that they have their mind set on, they're going to figure out a way to do it. They're going to get it done one way or the other. It's that tenacity that's there. So Nehemiah, in reaction, said, you know what? We're going to persevere. We've got discouragement all around us, but we're going to carry out the work. Nehemiah persevered. Notice also this. Nehemiah planned. He planned. Verse 13, so in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall and open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. Verses 16 through 20, from that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held spears, shields, and bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside him, and I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread. We are separated on the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. Nehemiah took the concerns, he took the fears, he took all of the things the people were anxious about and he said listen we're going to do okay we're going to plan we're going to have a purpose and if we get attacked we will defend he took the time to do things well in an organized fashion and i believe god honored that and was pleased by that planning helps us out tremendously when we are discouraged, when we are brought down low, and that could be in a spiritual battle, it could be in a physical battle, it could be in some type of uh, arena in our life, planning makes a huge difference. Because a lot of times, we get overwhelmed. We, we get overwhelmed by everything that goes on. I know um, when we were uh, doing virtual school, Grace was overwhelmed by the schoolwork that she got. And, you know, she wasn't getting any more or less schoolwork than she usually gets, but she got overwhelmed. The reason being is it all came at her at once. You know, she was on, online and, you know, you got taught for a few uh, hours and it was like, all right, do this, do this, do this. She was overwhelmed. And what helped more than anything is Allison found out about it. And made a plan. Hey, do this, and do this, and do this, and do this, and then you'll be done. Discouragement many times makes us have tunnel vision. It makes us be overwhelmed by the trials that we have before us. Planning expands our vision and says what we can do and who we can do it with. Don't forget, Nehemiah said, hey, look, we're going to rally, and our God will fight for us. If you ever have, a, have the opportunity, if God puts it before you, and you're talking to somebody in crisis, oh, no, this has happened. Planning can help someone see a little bit of the bigger picture, saying, oh, wait a minute, okay, yeah, 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 we got a plan. We have all this going on, but you know what? We're going to see this doctor, and then we're going to see this test, and then we're going to have this treatment, and then we're going to have this treatment, and then we're going to go, and it's going to be all the better. In discouragement, do not forget the plan, because the plan helps defeat it. He, he planned, but notice also, 
Nehemiah gave positive reinforcement. He gave positive re reinforcement. Verse 14, And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Nehemiah said two things here, both that are important. Number one, remember the Lord. Remember who we are working for and remember his power, his greatness, his ability. By the way, we think about the many wars that America has been through. And you know what? There's a bunch of battle cries that begin with remember. Um, the famous one of Texas, remember the... Alamo. There we go. World War I, remember the... A little harder trivia. Lusitania. And it's seeking. World War II... Remember Pearl Harbor. The Spanish-American War. Remember the Maine. We have all of these things. It's a rally cry. For the battles, it was remember this thing that happened. We are fighting for a purpose. For us as believers, in the midst of discouragement, the positive reinforcement that we have, is we remember the power of God Almighty. Because it's so easy for us to forget. We remember who we, have, who we fight for. We remember that with God, it is easy. The second one is this. The second word is fight. He says fight. Fight for your loved ones. Fight for those things that are dear to you. You know, one of the things we've got to remember is in the world in which we live right now, we got discouragement. We've got a difficult thing before us, but you know what? It means we can have a little fight in us. It means we can have a voice. It means we've got something to stand for in the world in which we live in today. And that's the encouragement. Remember the Lord, but also fight, because what we fight for is worth it. We fight for the souls of the lost. We fight for morality. We fight for what is right and good and holy and just. We fight for the glory of God in a world that wants to tarnish it. By the way, positive reinforcement is a powerful thing. How many of y'all have ever received a compliment and it kept you going for like four days? I mean, that's really, you, it, it could be as something as simple as, boy, I really like that tie. That looks good. I like your haircut. You know, I, I, I think what you're wearing is just wonderful. You know what? That, that cake that you made was just delicious. Or the, the sermon that you preached or the song you sung or the compliment you gave the card or something like that. You know, y'all have ever gotten a card and it just said something nice and it just made your day. It was like a new AA battery was put inside of you. There is something to be said about encouragement. But also this, we see this. Nehemiah prepared the people. He prepared the people. Verse 9 and we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. 21 through 23, so we labored at the work. And half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night and may be a labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. Now it's interesting. He said, none of us took off our clothes. Why in the world did he think he, he made that statement there? 
Sounds like they stayed ready. Yeah, they didn't realize. Really? Yeah. I've never worn chain mail. Um, <laughs> anybody wants to buy me a suit of it, I'll try it on. But you think about the armor, you think about all the things that kept them ready, whether it be a leather armor or a metal armor or anything of that nature, it had to have been heavy. To take it off would have been to take off that burden, to relax, but you wouldn't be ready. So Nehemiah is saying, listen, I'm going to prepare you. You are going to be ready the whole time. So the people were dedicated to that. And you think about it too, there would have been some discomfort. I have been camping and been in the same clothes for a long while. I found this out. After a while, you begin to stink. <laughs> there was some discomfort there. But as a purpose, there was a purpose behind it to always be ready. These people were serious about being prepared. I could pull over and park here for a long time, but I'm not going to. But I'm going to say this. Preparedness <coughs> will beat back discouragement every time. Let me say that again. Preparedness will beat back discouragement every time because it empowers us. We're never really scared of things we are prepared for. We're not really scared about things that, you know, we already know might come or we've handled before. You know, if, if somebody runs up to us and goes, oh no, oh no, I have a paper cut. I'm guessing about everybody here already knows how to, how to handle one of those things. You know, you go, you get a band-aid, you know, you put some Neosporin on it, you wrap it up, it's all good. You're not too worried about those things. Why? Because you're prepared for it. Um, I know uh, when Grace was born, you know, the idea of, of dirty diapers came. At first, a little intimidating. This was new territory. Hadn't happened before. You know, you give it a little while. No big deal, right? All good. Because you're prepared. Preparedness is something that beats back discouragement because of the empowerment. Let me encourage you. Maybe there's something in your life right now that you got a question about. Could be anything biblical. It could be something within the world in which we live in. It could be something you're struggling with. Choose two questions you really, really, really want an answer for. Questions that might have thrown you off. Something that somebody said to you, either at a family gathering or in a, in a conversation in a coffee house. Write them down and find the answers for them. Uh, gotquestions.org, a magnificent website, most likely will have it. If you got trouble, I've got books. I most likely have four books on it that'll give you the answer to it. But get a rock solid foundation about it and let it be your stronghold. Let it be your stronghold and go, hey, throw that question at me. Try to discourage me with that. I got you. How many of y'all remember or had a, had a child, grandchild, or saw them before? The math raps? You all remember? You know what I'm talking about? I got a nod. Anybody remember the math rap things? So math raps are a little piece of plastic. They're about this big. And they might have like a four on them. They have a six on them. They have multiplication, subtraction, all of these things. Um, but they'll have a number. They have like number eight. And then it'll go like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. But what it is, is you have to wrap the string around the number, multiply it or add it to whatever the big number is, and you got to find the answer. And the idea is you wrap and you wrap and it teaches math. It's repeatable. Well, in um, 
make sure I say this right, in third grade, my teachers got a brand new thing called math wraps. And we thought they were great. And I wanted one. Because we had a we had free time. So here it is. I wanted to interact with this new thing. And I got the worst math wrap there was. I got number seven. Multiplication. And that was the only one I could get. And I'll tell you, I didn't want to do seven. Seven's not a fun number to multiply with. I want something like two. Two's easy. But you know what? I got that. And I worked it. And I worked it. And there was a stopwatch in the back. And there was nobody else in that class that could beat me at number seven. I was like, yeah, come on, let's go. Let's go with this, because I knew it. If you are discouraged by something, make it your stronghold and go, you know what? God's got this. I am going to pour my, my intellect into it. I'm going to get an answer for that so that when it comes knocking, I'm going to be like, oh, no, not in my house. Not in my house. As we close tonight, let me leave you with, uh, with two truths. Discouragement first can be fought and defeated. It can be fought and defeated. Nehemiah faced it, responded it, uh, responded head on. It took remembering, preparing, encouraging. But listen, it could be fought. One of the things we've always got to remember is the enemies we face can be defeated. Whatever struggle we face can be defeated. We've got God on our side. Is there anything too difficult for God? I mean, there's like Bible verses with that saying, nothing's too difficult. We have Psalms. Nothing is too difficult for thee. I forget the great and mighty God. I can't remember the whole thing. But there's whole songs about it. No, we won't sing it right now. Um, never think that discouragement, the discouragement you face, is an unstoppable foe. Friends, we live in a world right now where we have a really high suicide rate amongst certain age groups. One of the reasons for that suicide rate being so high is they can't see that whatever it is they're facing, whatever turmoil, whatever difficulty they're going through, they don't see any hope of it being an end. Never forget, we fight foes that can be defeated. It's also this. Something important. Remembering the power of God is the key to accessing the power you need to overcome discouragement. Remembering the power of God is the key to accessing the power you need to overcome encouragement. Um. There's so little we can do on our own. When we think about our strength, um, we were working yesterday on the uh, um, on the playground stuff, and um, Nick, you were there. Is uh, putting that playground thing together. Is that a one man job? Uh, no, it's yeah. not a one man job. <laughs> Ain't no way. You know, if I mean, it's not a time thing. It's not anything. You can't do it by yourself, can you? That, that thing is, uh, it's about a 15-man job, um, and about 14 of them need PhDs in engineering. Um, and about half the power tools at, at Home Depot. Um, no, you just need an Allen wrench, but you, it, you need patience is what you need. So often in this life, we try to do it on our own. We hit a problem, we hit something, we forget to pray, we forget God, we lose that power, and darkness overcomes us. Why? Because we go off on our own. One of the reasons, one of the great, amazing things we get to invite people to is church so that people will know they're not alone. One of the reasons why these prayer letters are so powerful is because when somebody opens them and says, 
hey, there's my name, and here are all these other names, what does it shout out? You're not alone. We remember the power of God. We remember we're not alone. By the way, we remember the name of God. Emmanuel, God with us. And that just fires us up. That fires us up and says, wait a minute here, I'm not alone in all this. That's one of the reasons why we go to our, our children, to our nieces and our nephews, our grandkids. That's why we go to their sporting programs. We're going to cheer them on. And know, hey, yeah, you know what? You got people not only on your team, you got people in the stands and they're cheering you on. You're not alone. It's one of the things Nehemiah did in connecting people and encouraging people to defeat that discouragement. He said, you're not alone. You've got a God in heaven on your side and you got brothers and sisters around you. As we close tonight, questions, comments, observations. And amazingly, I did this with one cough drop. <laughs> Let's bow in order of prayer as we close tonight. Father, thank you for your word and how it teaches us, how it guides us and directs us and shows us your character and power. Lord, I pray now that as we as we consider what we've learned, as we let it settle in our heart, I pray that you would bolt it down tightly. We know we are going to face rough times. I pray that you would help us to remember what we've learned, that we might not go through difficult times alone. <coughs> help us to remember you, to pray, to grip hold of the truth that you have given us, that you will never leave us or forsake us. Lord, as we leave this place, I pray that you would dismiss us with your blessings. I pray that you'd give us safety in our journeys, that you would allow us to go forth and have the privilege of ministering to, to someone in need, to encourage someone to come to church to share the gospel with someone who hasn't heard. Lord, into your hands we lift all these things. We pray them in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you all tonight.